Hello, and welcome everyone to the Lab Water Source, an interactive webinar series where we wade through everything from the fundamentals of buying and maintaining a laboratory water purification system to ensuring that that system meets your application needs. I'm your host, Jeff Scheibel, and today's presentation is Choosing the Right Water Purification System. Today's presenter is Julie Foster. Julie is a PhD and the Global Product Manager for the Water Purification Product Line at Thermo Fisher Scientific. In this capacity, Dr. Foster manages the product life cycle from strategic planning to tactical activities. This webinar is being recorded for future playback. As registered guests, you will receive a link to the recording in your email when it becomes available. Our presentation, including Q&A, will last about an hour. Please type any questions that you would like to ask into the text box in the Q&A module that you see on the right side of the screen. Julie will be taking relevant questions throughout the presentation, and we'll save a few for the end. You'll be asked to participate in this interactive webinar by answering various survey questions that will be posted throughout the presentation. The results will then be shared so that you can compare your answers with your peers. This ends the preliminary instruction, so without further delay, I present to you Dr. Julie Foster. Thanks. So today we're going to talk about choosing the right water purification system for your lab. So as an overview of the presentation, the three things that I want to touch on today are what type of water do you need in your lab, what factors beyond the type of water that you need are going to influence your decision, and what are the trends and the features of water purification systems. So let's start with what kind of water do you need in your lab. And as a review, I talked about this in the last webinar, um, why to do labs need special water. And I just want to emphasize this one more time because I think it's important to note that typical tap water, as the illustration demonstrates, really has a, a variety of different impurities in it. it. Has salt, has bacteria, organics, and nucleases, all of which are completely healthy for you to drink. They're in levels that are safe for you. However, they may not be ideal for the different applications that you're doing in your laboratory. So for example, if you follow that first arrow up, you can see that some of the impurities will clog filters, they'll leave mineral deposits on your, on um, this, this picture as a shower head, but if you had a glassware washer or an autoclave, you could see the same thing. It's just excess minerals and salts that are in the tap water that will leave deposits. The middle arrow points to an HPLC trace and any kind of excess organics that are in the water that you're using that touch your sample or any part of the analysis are going to leave behind a trace. And so that top trace is, is just deionized water that has organic impurities still in it. And you can see all kinds of peaks. And if you try to find your sample in it, good luck. It may be hidden in there or may not. The bottom trace, the nice smooth line, is from ultra pure water where there aren't any background impure impurities of organics. And then if you follow the lower arrow um, in cell and tissue culture, you can think about ions. Each one of those um, ions, bacteria, organics, and nucleases are going to be unwelcome into your experiment. It can cause um, even some different morphology issues with cell and tissue culture. So not, tap water is not a, a great option for lab equipment or any kind of sensitive analytical or biochemical applications in your lab. So what kind of water do you need? And there's some nomenclature that we use that all water companies use. It's helpful to have an idea of what it is. So this is the American Society for Testing and Materials, also known as ASTM. It is an American standard, but it's used globally. So no matter where you're at, you're going to hear these ASTM type 1, type 2, and type 3. In the laboratory, you may know these as ultra pure water or 18.2 water, pure water, and the type 3 is generally known as RO water, also known as reverse osmosis water. And they're really in order of purity. Type 1 ultra pure water is the most pure. It's devoid of all ions, organics, um, and it can even be made to be pure of nucleases and pyrogens. So ultra pure water for the most um, sensitive applications. Pure water, a little less pure, but 
totally appropriate for things like creating buffers or washing glassware. And then RO water, the least pure of the three, is a great um, type of water to use with glassware washing or even any kind of laboratory feed. It's it's pure, but not it's purer than tap water, but not as pure as ultra pure. So it's a great source of water to feed, like a glassware washer, or to put into a water bath, that kind of thing. So just to re-emphasize um, what is an appropriate use for each of these types of water, I showed you tap water at the beginning of the of the webinar. This is a representation of ultra pure water. The blue dot is empty. None of the uh, salts bacteria, organics, nothing is in there. And that's because ultra-pure water can be made to be completely pure. You might think that if you're starting a lab, um, it would be a good idea just to get an ultra-pure water system, and then you could use it in every application in your laboratory. Unfortunately, there's a couple of places the ultra-pure water just doesn't work. And the first one, the arrow leading up to feeding lab equipment, is a great example. You might think like that, hey, you know, I'll avoid mineral deposits if I get ultra pure water. There are no ions in it, so that that'll be perfect. But it, ultra pure water is actually aggressive, unstable, doesn't like to not have ions. So as soon as the system dispenses ultra pure water, what happens is it starts looking for ions and looks to regain a balance. It'll grab ions from the air. And if you pump ultra-pure water into anything that has metal, where it comes into contact with metal, so this would be like an autoclave, dishware, a glassware washer, um, a water bath, a CO2 incubator, if those come into contact with ultra-pure water, the ultra-pure water will pull the ions away from the metal and start creating pitting. So not a good use um, for ultra-pure water. In contrast to that, because of the nature that it is so pure, it's really perfect for very sensitive applications, such as HPLC, because there's not going to be any background organics in the water, and also really perfect for cell culture. Again, no ions, no bacteria, no nucleases, no pyrogens. So really great for those sensitive applications. In reverse osmosis water, again, this is a review from the last webinar. A really appropriate, a great um, water choice to feed lab equipment. It's because tap water, which has so much excess minerals and organics, when you go through the process of re reverse osmosis, it removes a lot of those minerals and organics. So they're still there. It's not uh, aggressive water. It's balanced water um, that you can that is totally appropriate for lab equipment. Now, because the reverse osmosis still does have organics and ions and those kind of things in it, not appropriate for very sensitive applications such as HPLC. And you can extend that thought. Any of the sensitive analytical methods, ICPMS, AA, um, it's going to have too many contaminants. The reverse osmosis water will have too many contaminants to be appropriate for that. Likewise for cell culture, cell culture is very touchy. You don't want to introduce variability in your water. So reverse osmosis water is not appropriate for cell culture. So that really brings us to our first survey question. Thank you, Allison. Our first question, I'm sorry, thank you, Julie. Our first question, what type of water do you have in your lab? Using the survey question module, please select your answer now. If at any time you have a question for Julie, you can ask it using the Q&A module that you see in the lower right corner of your screen. Julie will take your questions throughout the presentation, and we'll save a few for the end. We'll give it another moment as answers are still coming in. OK, I will now share the results and hand the reins back to Julie. Thanks, Jeff. OK, so I, what I see from, from everybody who answered the survey question is the majority of you have that type 2 water. That doesn't surprise me. A lot of laboratories have central systems that pipe in um, deionized water. So there will be a spigot with your tap water, and then there will be another spigot that's usually DI water. So that's not too unusual. And then uh, I'm a little surprised that not more of you have type 1 water. Um, a lot of you have RO water. That's, that's good. 
So let's talk a little bit more about the other factors beyond water type that are going to affect your decision to purchase on which system to purchase. So obviously, with all the talk, especially in the US, but also in Europe, budgets are getting tighter and tighter. And so I know lab managers and PIs are starting to look very closely on how you all are spending your money. So there's two costs that I want to make you very aware of when you're thinking about buying a water purification system. The first cost is the upfront cost. What does it cost for you to purchase the water system? And you can even see on the table here, um, there's a pretty big price difference between a type 1 water, a type 2 water purification system, RO, and then even just a real simple cartridge and filter system. Because type 1 water systems produce such pure water, there's a lot of technology in those boxes. And it tends to be more advanced technology than in the type 2 and RO. So they, are much, they can be much more expensive than the other types of water purification systems. Just reemphasizing the fact that you want to make sure that that's what you need before you buy it. So you're going to go shop around, look at quotes. When the sales reps approach you and get involved in this process with you in deciding a water purification system, the upfront cost is usually you know, extremely transparent. They're going to give you a quote, and it'll have a price of the water system. What's not always really apparent in that quote, because, and especially because all of, uh, all of the different companies do it really differently, is what is included in that quote. And that's something you're going to need to ask. Have them write out all of the things that are included. And in, maybe there's only one part number on your quote but ask them what is in that part number, what is in that quote. Because some companies, um, ours in particular, we will um, bundle, we'll create a bundle for you. When you purchase a water system, you'll get all your startup cartridges along with it. So you'll see one part number, but you'll get loads of stuff in that one part number. In contrast, if you're comparing our quote to another company, they may not bundle everything, or they'll bundle maybe some of the things, but not all of the things. So it's an important question to ask what comes with it. What's your upfront cost? And then even uh, a little bit more tricky to get at is what are your annual costs? So you're going to have a water purification system that you'll install in your lab. There's going to be cartridges and filters, and maybe a UV lamp, and maybe an ultra filter. All of those will need to be changed at some point, and it depends on the system, depends on the company, how often you're changing it, but they will need to get changed, and you'll have to purchase those. Uh, we group them all and call them consumables, things that you have to change at some point in the life of the system. So ask the sales rep, this is the time to do it, what are the costs for each of those filters and cartridges, and how often, on average, are people having to change them? So two things to ask your sales rep when you're shopping around for a water system. What are the upfront costs? What's included in there? And what are the annual costs? That will help you make a good decision and understand um, how this is going to affect your budget. There are different types of water systems. And what we talk about the most um, are point of use water systems, which is what the picture shows on the right. But I wanted to just introduce you to some of the vocabulary around the other types of water system that you may come into contact with and actually may be a better fit for you in your circumstances in the laboratory. The first bullet is central systems. And this is really a large system. It's usually in the basement of a building. And it supplies water either for many, many labs or for the entire building. So you may not have even seen it. You might not have ever thought about it. But again, if you have a tap water spigot on your sink and then you have this other spigot, it's probably a deionized water spigot that leads to a central system in the basement of your building. So the benefits of having a central system are that it's usually the facilities group who supports this from a budget standpoint and also from a maintenance standpoint. So that's nice. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind. The challenge would be is that you don't ever know at any one moment what the quality of the water is. And the quality of the water can, in, can be influenced pretty readily by how frequently the system is being maintained. And we are pretty familiar with um, accounts and universities that 
maintain their central system really well and some that don't maintain their central system very well. So if you're dependent on that water that's coming out of the spigot in an important way, if it's feeding a piece of equipment that's important to you, you might get a little bit involved with the facilities group and just see what that maintenance schedule looks like. Now point of use water systems, these are the water systems that you're going to have in your lab. And they typically, um, you'll see one water system for the whole lab, although the trends lately that we've seen are smaller water systems and labs will have multiple smaller water systems that are dedicated to specific applications. So that's kind of a trend that we've been seeing lately. The benefit of a point of use system is that you have control of the maintenance of the system, so you know when the, la the cartridge was changed last. You can have a visual on the water quality, because if you can, I know it's a small picture, but there's a green screen on the water system there, and it has a readout 18.2 of the quality of the water. So you can always see that the water is the quality you need it to be before you dispense and use it. Plus, you get the water fresh from the system. It's sitting right in front of you. You can dispense it and use it immediately. The water is not being piped through the building, through the different um, pipings that are however old. <laughs> it's fresh. The challenge of a point of use water system is it's going to take up some lab space. And it's going to probably come out of your budget to maintain, purchase, and repair the system. The last two are a little bit of um, specialty water systems. The clinical analyzer feed system is a specialized water purification system specific to clinical analyzers. So if anyone out there uses clinical analyzers, I can give you, if you, I will provide the, my email at the end of the presentation. If you need information, we can send it specifically for you. It's a great system. I highly encourage you to use a water system specific for clinical analyzers because they have additional emergency backup systems in, in the water purification system that's very handy. So it's a, good, uh, it's a good idea to get a specialized system if you're using those analyzers. And last but not least, our cartridge systems. These are just you know, normal cartridges full of resin. Um, if you have the need for DI water and it's, you don't have a central system, you just need a little bit every day, just having a cartridge that makes DI water is pretty smart. So those are even available for you. So a lot of different water systems to choose from. But we're going to, for the remainder of the webinar, talk about the point of use system. So point of use water systems from almost every company that I'm aware of uses a combination of seven different technologies. There's eight on the slide because it includes distillation. Distillation is not a purification technology that most water companies offer anymore. Thermo Fisher Scientific does still offer distillation in the form of a still. So if you're, in, um, if you're looking for information from, for stills, let me know. I can send that to you. But otherwise, the other seven are really the same technologies that companies use over and over again in combination to create water purification systems. And the reason that there are seven and not just one or two is they all kind of do different things. And we put them together so that they can achieve um, a total purification uh, flow through the system. So just to give you an idea, like reverse osmosis, this technology specifically is broad spectrum removal. So it removes a lot of things. It removes ions and organics and some bacteria. But it doesn't remove any of those impurities to 100%. So reverse osmosis, you'll see that technology in any water system that has to process tap water, for example. Um, I'll skip distillation and go to deionization. This is a technology that removes ions. We see this most often in the form of a cartridge with resin in it. Electrodeionization uses electricity to deionize water. UV oxidase oxidation oxidizes organics and bacteria. So it's great to have a UV lamp in your system to control bacteria at the very least. But um, most beneficial, it will knock the level of organics down to one to five parts per billion, so extremely low. 
Adsorption removes organics and chlorine that's often found in a cartridge in the form of um, carbon. Ultrafiltration removes nucleases, pyrogens, and bacteria. That's a term that if you're doing any kind of molecular or cellular biology, I would encourage you to write that down. Ultrafiltration in an ultrafilter is extremely helpful for you folks who are doing any kind of biochemical, biological, cell and tissue culture, anything in that, um, anything that is sensitive to nucleases, pyrogens, or bacteria because there's a technology that most water purification companies can offer to you that will create water that is free of nucleases, pyrogens, and bacteria. And then finally, final filter. It's the filter at the end of the system that removes any, any final particles or bacteria. So when you are out there shopping for a water purification system, and you're looking at different companies, you'll notice that they don't just have one system for each water type. They have multiple systems that can create type 1, type 2, and RO water. And the reason is, I mean, any system that makes type 1 water makes type 1 water from company to company. So that's, that's nice to know, right? They're all making the same quality of water. So the differences really lie in normally the user interface. How do you dispense the water? Um, do you, what kind of um, display do you want to use? Do you want the system to sit on the bench or on the wall or on the floor? Do you need a lot of water or a little water? So it's those kind of differences that are the reason we have so many choices, for example, in the type 1 category or the type 2 category. We know that, again, budgets are a little tight, and so sometimes what we start to do is borrow water from our neighbors. And I would um, just try to give you a little bit of information so that you understand the implications of borrowing water if that's, if that's what you need to do. So in general, if you're borrowing pure water, so this is type 2 and RO water, and you're using them in non-critical applications, it's pretty acceptable to store water. Anytime purified water is placed into a container and exposed to air, you can imagine that the purity level is going to start dropping off. It's going to absorb CO2 from the air. It may come into contact with bacteria. It's going to pull organics out of whatever it's sitting in. So just understand that when you store it and how long you store it and what you store it in is going to influence the overall purity of the water. That said, you can imagine the ultra-pure water should never be stored. Or better said, as soon as you store ultra-pure water, it won't be ultra-pure for long. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. I would say if you're doing it in your lab and it seems to be working, I wouldn't change anything. But if you're doing it in your lab and you start to see some variability in your results, could be that you're introducing some um, variability when you're storing water. And that brings us to our next survey question. Thank you, Julie. Our next question, if you are borrowing water, what kind of water do you borrow? Using the survey question module in the center of your screen, please log your answer now. And as another reminder, Julie will be taking your questions. If you have a question for Julie, you can ask it using the Q&A module that you see in the lower right corner of your screen. Give it another moment as answers are still coming in. OK, let's share the results and hand the reins back to Julie. Thanks, Jeff. So the majority of you don't need to borrow water. I think that's that's great. I think ideally that's where we're at with it. If you're, again, sharing RO water, not so critical. Type 1 water, the folks that hit that button, now you know that um, it, it's affecting the quality of your water. And if it's working for you, it's working for you. I wouldn't change it. But if, it's, if you're seeing some variability in your results, then you might think about um, the choice to store that water. Let's go ahead and move on to a couple of different uh, another couple of things that we don't sometimes think about when we're purchasing upfront our water system, but um, depending on your situation in the lab, they, it may really p play a critical role in the decision to purchase 
a water system. So one thing you might ask from the sales rep is what kind of warranty is available for covering parts and labor? I show one year, that's the, the thermoscientific warranty for water purification systems. Every company is different, so check with the company that you purchase from what the warranty is. You also might be interested in having a professional come and install the water system, and they can also validate the water system. Most companies that, I, that I'm aware of offer those, but you want to ask, do they do it and what's the cost of that? There are also many maintenance options available, or you can try to maintain the system yourself. Different companies have different views on maintaining your water system. Ask the sales rep if the water system is one that you could maintain. Um, so that's a question you want to ask. If you don't want to maintain it, you can purchase, normally you can purchase maintenance options from the service group. Um, or, like I said, you can maintain the system yourself for many systems. You just need to say, ask the sales rep if the system you're purchasing is something that you can maintain. But oftentimes, these point of view systems are pretty simple. Uh, I know with our system, we design them so that you can maintain the system yourself, so you can save some extra money maintaining and changing cartridges yourself. It's su super easy to do. Why not? But you want to ask that. The last bullet I think is really important. It's um, something that's unique to Thermo Fisher Scientific. We offer something called the H2O Select Analysis. That's what the picture on the right is. What this is, it's the ability to test the feed water for your water purification system. And why would you need to do that? So anytime you purchase a water purification system from any company, there's going to be a set of guidelines that tell you the quality of water going, that should go into that water system so that the water system works like it should. So it produces the right amount of water, the right quality of water, and so that the cartridges have a reasonable life. If your water doesn't meet those standards, what can happen is you're, you will end up replacing cartridges more frequently, or even at the worst, the quality of the water isn't going to be what you think it is. So it's important to know what the quality of water is going into your water system and does it meet the criteria for that water, for that system that you're purchasing. So to do that, to provide that service to our customers, we offer H2O Select Analysis. It's a free analysis. We'll send you the kit and you'll take, you can see in the picture there's a bottle of water. It's an algae bottle that you'll fill with the water that you intend to supply your water purification system. And then you can see in the picture she's filling out a questionnaire. That questionnaire asks questions like, how often, um, how much water do you need every day, what water? And this gets to what kind of system you need and how big should it be. So that when you get the analysis results back, you'll have a list of part numbers. You'll have a quote of exactly what you need to order that fits your application needs, and it'll tell you about your water. So if your water is, for example, too hard for the system, if it's got too much chlorine for the system, then the analysis will come back and tell you that perhaps you need to have some additional pretreatment in front of it, and it'll tell you what you need. So that's a, a helpful service to just support the life of your system so that you have a really good experience using the water system. So let's discuss some new trends and innovation in water purification systems. But first, we'll stop and take a survey question. Thank you again, Julie. Our third and final survey question, where does your water system live in your lab? Using the survey question module, please select your answer now. We're coming up on the Q&A session in just a bit. We have received several questions. If you have a question for Julie, you can ask it using the Q&A module that you see in the lower right corner of your screen. Again, Julie will be taking your questions in just a bit. Give it one more moment. OK, let's share the results and hand the reins back to Julie. Thanks, Jeff. So the vast majority of you have your water system sitting on the bench. 
probably um, that doesn't surprise me too much. And I'll just describe a couple of different options that you have in case your bench space is getting a little tight. So one of the helpful features that um, most water companies can offer are remote dispensers. And remote dispensers are little modules that are connected to the main purification system, but they can be at a certain distance away from the system and they can dispense water. That is something that almost any company can offer. What the latest update on remote dispensers has been is now full control, full access to your water purification system at the remote dispenser. So the challenge was basically if you have a remote dispenser, some customers want to put their purification system, they want to mount them high on the wall and out of the way, or they want to put them um, underneath the bench so that it's really kind of hidden away. If you do that, and you have an alarm on the system, or if you need to change a setting on the system, you do have to get back to that purification system to set it. So the advancement here is that now remote dispensers, some remote dispensers have full control of the system at the dispenser. So you don't have to search back for the water. You don't have to climb up on the wall and change a setting or see what the alarm is or go under the bench to make adjustments with the system. All of the control is there at the remote dispenser. And another helpful feature, along with this idea that bench space is a bit tight, are floor-mounted systems. So this system in particular is a water purification system on the top. You can see that it looks pretty familiar. On the bottom, what you can't see behind the door is a 100 liter tank that's fully integrated into the system. And the whole system is on rollers. So this is a really a great option, again, if you don't have any lab space or any bench space and you don't want to mount the system on the wall because you're going to have a tank along with it, then you can purchase one of these, um, we call them a lab tower system. Other companies have different names for them. But you can um, have a system that's totally independent and just sits on the floor. And what I see that this has been a great choice is for um, customers who have shared space. So if you have a shared autoclave room or a glassware washer room, there's not, there aren't usually any benches there anyways. So this is a great option um, to provide water for those labs. UV intensity monitoring is an interesting technology that was launched a couple years ago um, by Thermo Fisher Scientific. And what this is, is that it's in response to a challenge with TOC monitoring. And just to back up, uh, we talked about this last webinar, but I'll just quick give you a, a definition of what that is. TOC monitoring is the ability of the system to read out the amount of organics in the product water. So TOC stands for total organic carbon. So your system already is reading out the quality of the water in terms of ions. So it's always reading out 18.2. That's something probably everyone's familiar with. But you can purchase water systems that will read out the organic level as well, right underneath it. So it'll read out 18.2 to show you there are no ions in the water. And then if you purchase the system with a TOC monitor, it'll read out the amount of, of organics in the water. So this is typically one to five parts per billion. So TOC monitors are pretty valuable to customers who are um, using the water in connection with any kind of application that's sensitive to organics. Um, so TOC monitoring becoming more and more of a technology that customers want. But there's always been a challenge with TOC monitoring. It's a real-time measurement of organics in the water, but it's a big but. <laughs> it's dependent on the strength of the UV bulb that's in the system. So it only works if the UV bulb is working like it needs to. So we, always, we were a little worried about this. How do you know if the UV bulb isn't working the way it should so that you can be aware it's time to change it 
um, and that your TOC measurement may not be accurate. So this was our challenge that we decided to take on. And the solution, again, we launched this a couple years ago, was that we would develop a photoelectrode that ensures the UV bulb is always working properly. It sits right next to the UV bulb, and it makes sure that the bulb's always working accurately. If it doesn't work, if it starts to fail, then the system alarms and tells you to change the UV bulb. So this, guarantee, this ensures accuracy of the TOC measurement. And again, it, it offers the opportunity to provide an alarm to you to notify you to change the UV bulb. So this is a pretty important feature. Another helpful feature is this idea of a one part number gets you everything. So the challenge was how to figure out what needs to be ordered. Because in the past, the system has shipped separately than the consumables and cartridges. So that was the challenge. So what we see companies moving towards is a one part number gets you everything. So it ensures that everything ships in one box. That way, when you order your water purification system, you're not waiting because you forgot to order a cartridge or you forgot a hose or a whatever else you may have forgotten. It all ships in the box, no surprises. It makes ordering really easy. So you'll notice that a lot of companies are going towards that. As I cautioned you, when you're having that budget talk with the sales rep, this can kind of be a double-edged sword. It's great, you're going to get everything you need under that one part number, but make sure you understand when you're comparing water system to water system from different companies that you understand what comes in that, that part number. Another really helpful feature has been the development of smart tanks. So the challenge was, whenever you have a water purification system that has a reverse osmosis technology in it, it always is going to require that you purchase a tank. And the tank is, um, unless you have that lab tower system where it's integrated, it's going to give you some options for sizes, a 30, a 60, 100. Those are kind of typical. Every water company does it a little different, but it's usually around 30 liters, 60 liters, or 100 liters. And then you have to choose, which one do I need? And why it's important to get this right is because when you have standing water, and I think we're all pretty aware of this, when you have water that's just sitting in a tank, it's going to start growing. It's going to start growing contaminants. So you want to make sure that the water in the tank is always being recirculated out every one to two days. And I'll caveat this even by saying, all the water companies, we all tackle this a little different on how to keep that water fresh. What we do at Thermo Fisher Scientific, our, our systems recirculate that water, so it pulls in water, puts it through a cartridge in the system, and sends it back out into the tank. Some companies put a UV lamp into the tank to irradiate it and make sure that the tank stays clean. But if you aren't using any kind of water, if you're really not changing that water every couple of days, there isn't a UV ball big enough in the world to irradiate all of the contaminants away. There's not enough recirculation that can happen to keep that water, that system clean. Um, so the best thing you can do is make sure that right up front you've got the right size tank and that you're using that water every one to two days. That's the best thing you can do. And then the UV lamp and the recirculation will keep that water nice and fresh. So that's what you need to be aware of. Of course, sometimes your, your needs are changing from day to day. So maybe on Mondays, the whole lab makes media, and you need 100 liters from the tank. And then the rest of the week, you're only using 15 or 20 liters per day. That's, that actually happened on our lab. We had a big media day. It's where we would use a lot of water one day, and then the rest we wouldn't. Or if you're a new lab and you're just starting, there's only a couple of people in the lab, but you intend to grow. So your system needs to be able to grow with you. So this, de this development of the smart tank has been really useful. What happens is that the tank has different float switches in it. And you can tell the system where is full. Is it at 70%? Does that trigger the tank to be full and it stops filling? 
or is 100% full for the tank, and it'll fill the whole 100 liter tank. And you can change that day by day. If you need Monday 100 liters, then on Sunday night set that to 100, and it'll fill all the whole, entire tank full. But if the rest of the week you're only going to need half the tank to be filled, then you can program the system very easily to just fill the tank halfway, for example. So these smart tanks are really great, really useful. Another feature that has come out is the use of a, um, is the desire to have a EDI system with a tank to be able to have that tank water recirculate. So if you had a water system that had EDI technology, and EDI stands for electro-deionization, it's, it's a module that acts like a cartridge, except that it uses electricity to keep the car what would be like a cartridge, which removes ions, it keeps it fresh. So it uses electricity to deionize water. Now, any water system that had an EDI cell traditionally did not have an ion exchange cartridge because it would replace it. But because there's no ion exchange cartridge in the, in the system, then you couldn't recirculate the tank water. So then you had tank water that really you couldn't use because it would sit there and, and grow old. What we wanted to do is be able to have that tank water be usable. And so the solution was to create a special smaller cartridge in the system that allows the tank water to recirculate through it and remain polished so that not only are you producing type 1 water, which is what the system does, but that the tank water is also usable for other applications. We talked a little bit about maintenance of a water system and whether or not you could maintain a system yourself or if you had to purchase a plan to maintain the system. Again, we're just very aware that budgets are tight and we want to at least give you the option to maintain your own water system. So what we see what we've done here at Thermo Fisher Scientific, we see other water companies doing this, is to make those water systems more user friendly to maintain for the customer. So the challenge was changing filters sometimes is tough. You get wet, you, don't, you might have to depressurize the system before you change it, and customers start to get a little worried when, when you have to shut the system off and depressurize it and unscrew the cartridge, and then when you put it back in, does it leak? There's all kinds of um, issues sometimes just changing a filter. So the solution here. And every company has approached this a little differently, but the solution at our company was to create AquaStop connectors. And that's what you see in the picture here, these little metal connectors that give an audible click, actually, when you plug it in correctly. So when you want to remove the cartridge, first of all, you don't even have to turn off the system. You don't have to depressurize the system. You take the cover off the water system and push the little button like what what the model is doing there with their left hand. They're just pushing the metal button, and it unclicks away from the system. And then you, when you're adding a fresh water cartridge, then you just click them back together. And they make a click so you know it's nice and tight. You're not going to get any kind of leaks. You're not going to get wet. It's very easy to do and only takes seconds to change your filters. So this supports the idea that you can save some money by not having to buy maintenance plans if you can feel comfortable changing your own cartridges. So that's a really helpful feature that you might want to ask the sales reps about. So in summary, we talked about what kind of water do you need in your lab, because that's really going to give you the direction what, what type of water system you need. You can think about things like your budget, what it is short term for the upfront costs and long term for the annual cost, and also what kind of features do you need to improve your workflow in the lab? Do you need that system to be able to give you water remotely? Do you need full control at the XCAD remote? So all of those kind of features will help you work smartly in your laboratory. There are a lot of resources. If you want to take a look, I mentioned 
the, the stills. Um, there's a whole resource center for the stills and cartridges and clinical analyzer feed systems. Those can all be found at thermoscientific.com backslash peerwater. And that gives you access to all kinds of things, like videos, presentations, and um, technical application bulletins, for example. And if you did have any questions, we're going to take, we're going to have a Q&A here in a minute. But anything beyond that, or if you um, want to ask me something very specifically, feel free to email me at julie.foster at thermofisher.com. And I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you, Julie. We've received a handful of questions, and please do keep them coming. Before we get to those, though, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to some links now on your screen. The first is an attendee survey found in the lower left. Let us know what you thought about today's session and suggest future webinar topics. Also at the bottom of the screen, we've included several resource documents related to today's discussion. The first is our water book, a comprehensive guide to lab water, including a product catalog. Also, there's a pair of water purification additions to our popular Smart Note series and two new application notes. One other thing, Julie has mentioned several times uh, our last webinar, our Pure Water 101 webinar. If you would like to view the recording of that archive session, you can do so by visiting thermoscientific.com slash labwatersource. Okay, that's enough for me. Let's get to our questions for Julie. First. How quickly does the quality of stored water deteriorate? It is really very dependent on the conditions on which it's stored. So it depends on what container you're storing it in. Is it big? Is it small? Is it exposed to a lot of air or not? Um, and also where, where it is in the lab, um, if you're in a maintenance room, if you're in a laboratory. It so depends on a lot of factors. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a hard and fast. There's not even a formula that I could give you that could tell you that. Um, what I would say is water, from the moment it gets dispensed, um, will, of course, start to um, pull ions from the air. It pulls carbon dioxide almost right away. If it sits in a plastic carboy, if it sits in glass, it'll start pulling organics from it. So it's um, going to start degrading as soon as it's out. You mentioned reverse osmosis water. You're probably not using that in anything very sensitive anyways. If you're rinsing glassware or making just maybe some chemical buffers, who cares? You know, if it's stored a little bit, probably not going to affect you. But I, as I would always, um, as I would always recommend, though, if you if you're doing an experiment and you start to see some variability, Think about your water. And this was something that happened to me when I was in graduate school. Um, I, I had some PCR reactions, and they weren't working. And the last thing I thought about was the water. So it's just something to keep on the top of your mind if you're storing water. A related question, a little bit more specific. What is the max time I can store RO water in a tank? Yeah, I would say when you are storing water in a tank, and uh, by tank I think I'm going to assume that you mean like a tank that you bought with the system, and the difference there between like a carboy and a tank is a tank is going to have probably some sort of uh, carbon dioxide absorber filters, so it protects the water a little bit more. It usually has an overflow, but it's protected from bacteria, so it's a more protected environment in general, we tell customers that you want to use tank water every one to two days. So you want to make sure that if you have a 30-liter tank and you're filling it all the way, that every day or so you're using all that 30 liters so that you can um, turn over that water so that it can always be fresh for you. Next question, how can I best predict cartridge life? There are usually guidelines in the operational manual of your water system. So every cartridge from every different water company is a little different and their lifespan is different. So the operational manual is the first place I would go. If you can't find your manual, call the technical support from the company that you have the water system from. They'll, they'll have those kind of numbers. And what they should tell you and what you want to keep in mind is those are really guidelines on cartridge life. 
there's a couple of things that really influence that. Number one is how impure your water is when it goes into the system. So if you have water that's got a lot of ions or a lot of organics, your system's going to work hard to purify it. By working hard, meaning it's going to exhaust the cartridge resin faster. Um, typically, we're talking about the cartridges anyway. So it, the more impure the water going in, the harder the system works, the more often you're changing the consumables. Additionally, if you are using a lot of water, so if you're just using a couple liters a day, you will probably get a lot of cartridge life. If you're using loads and loads of water every day, especially if you're at the top of what they recommend for the water system, you most likely will be changing that cartridge more frequently. So when they give you the guidelines, go to the manual. If not the manual, technical support will tell you. If they don't warn you, let me warn you that those are guidelines and there's the water purity and the amount of water you're using every day influence that. Now that said, if you've had a water system and every six months you change a water cartridge and all of a sudden um, you're charging it, you're changing it every month, you know, give your tech support a call and say, hey, you know, we were used to getting this life, now we're getting this life and it doesn't make sense. So it's a good thing to pay attention to, for sure. Thank you, Julie. Our next question, what's the typical life expectancy of an EDI module? That really depends on water quality and also what company is providing the EDI module. So I would say in like as a ballpark, it's about three to five years, but it really depends. EDI modules tend to be very sensitive to hard water. So if you're diligent and you have a softener in front of it, and maybe you're not using so much water every day, maybe you get to that five years. If not, maybe you're more closer to the three years, but that in general, three to five years. You mentioned the H2O select analysis. Where do I find more information about that? You can go to the website um, thermoscientific.com backslash pure water, or you can send an email to me. My email is still up in the screen, so you can have time to jot that down. Um, and I can direct you. There's a web link that you can go. So you can go to the web and order one yourself. You can also um, contact your thermoscientific sales rep, and they can provide you with one. We have another question on EDI. Will an EDI system produce type 1 water and eliminate the need for mixed bed uh, polishing cartridges? It can. Uh, different companies handle this a little differently. So EDI modules, uh, the reason that they were created really is to replace ion cartridges, because ion cartridges and EDI modules, they do the same thing. They take ions out of the water. So the, when that technology was brought into the market, the reason it was brought on is so that you weren't having to throw away cartridges every 6 to 12 months, which is you know ballpark the life of a cartridge. So instead of every 6 to, nine, six to 12 months changing an ion cartridge, you're just changing an EDI module every 3 to 5 years. The cost is about a wash, but for you it might mean less maintenance. But that being said, as we went through the innovation slides, what we're seeing now is the issue with an EDI system that doesn't have an ion exchange cartridge is that it can't recirculate the tank water that's with it. And that becomes a problem, then the tank water is not usable. So now you'll see EDI systems that have like little cartridge packs that um, have a nice long life, you don't have to change it that frequently, and it polishes your tank water. So it gives you the benefit of an EDI cell, but also the benefit of having tank water that you can use for applications. Our next question, who needs UV intensity monitoring? So anyone who has a need for a TOC monitor, which is, again, total organic carbon. If you have the need to see the readout of carbon in your water, if you're doing an application sensitive to carbon and you want to see that, you would need, or it would be a really nice technology to have, UV intensity monitoring, because it makes sure 
that your TOC monitor is behaving and reading the TOC level in an accurate way all the time. Um, with this technology, this is a thermal scientific technology, it comes standard with every TOC system. So if you purchase a system from us, a type 1 water system with a TOC monitor, you will get standard UV intensity monitoring right along with it. Excellent. Uh, we've received a couple other questions that we'll address offline, but otherwise we have cleared the question queue, so we will wrap up now. But please, if you have any further questions, you can contact uh, Julie directly at julie.foster at thermofisher.com. Thank you to Julie and to you all for attending today's webinar. You will receive an email within the next few days with a link to the recorded archived webinar. Visit thermoscientific.com slash labwatersource for future webinar details and as our series grows to access any of our recorded on-demand sessions. Thank you all again and have a great day.